Hi everyone, it's uh, 9.30. Um, well, I was hoping for a little bit uh, bigger audience, but it's very early in the morning. Uh, you know, coming from Peck Hall, actually I saw some geese, uh, but I didn't see too many students. So, uh, well, I have one of my students from International Studies uh, helping me today. And uh, uh, he told me that uh, usually people have classes at this time. Mm -hmm. So um, hopefully more students will wake up uh, later. Um, so, uh, let's start uh, like I planned. My name is Sorin Nastasia, I'm the Director of the International Studies Program in the College of Arts and Sciences uh, at SIUE. Uh, like for previous editions, and this is the sixth edition of the International Studies Days, in the past few months I have collaborated with faculty, students, uh, organizational representatives and community members to put together an exciting series of events for the sixth edition of the International Studies Day at SIUE with the purpose of showcasing what the International Studies Program, uh, the College of Arts and Sciences, and the SIUE have to offer. It is good to be back in person with an on-campus day of, of events. Um, a special thank you to all those who have contributed to making International Studies Day a success. They are listed on the back of the program uh, that you have at the table. Um, three small requests for those attending. Please connect through social media throughout the day, share photos and com comments about the event uh, at SIUE. Uh, the handle, uh, always look at uh, at SIUE, INTS. Uh, please complete the event evaluation form. Uh, if you stay for just one event, then at the end of that event, or if you stay for the whole day of events, then by the end of the day. Please remember that there are sign-up sheets available uh, if you're professors. <laughs> are offering extra credit for attending and we will have food served uh, as well as prizes to draw throughout the day. Uh, now, Dr. Vance McCracken, Associate Dean of the College of Arts and Sciences, will provide the opening remarks. Thank you very much for making time to, to be with us. Thank you and good morning. So I'd like to welcome all of you to the 2023 International Studies Day. Uh, I especially want to welcome today's guest speakers, panelists, as well as the students who will be presenting their capstone projects later this afternoon. I don't need to tell this audience, but as this world becomes more increasingly interconnected, producing graduates with backgrounds and fields such as international art, culture and communication, international politics and diplomacy, and international development and sustainability becomes ever more important. As an interdisciplinary program, SIUE's International Studies program provides students with many opportunities to combine theoretical learning with hands-on applications, uh, travel study, uh, and I'm, I'm, I bought something already. <laughs> it, it allows them to combine their theoretical learning with hands-on applications, and as well as travel study to prepare for careers in these fields. I'm sure that some of them will be invited speakers right here for International Studies Day Sunday. Uh, I'd also like to take a moment to thank the International Studies Program Director, Sora Nastasia, and the affiliate faculty from the program for putting together what looks like a really great program for today. Please give them a round of applause. So there's a lot of interesting uh, discussion ahead, so thank you and sit back and enjoy. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Vice Dean McCracken. Um, well, uh, the first speaker of the day uh, is uh, Mr. Zhao Tu Kaung, uh, and hopefully I pronounced correctly your name, um, who is the founder of uh, Through the Eyes of Agony, an art program for displaced children from Myanmar. He also provided special assistance to Myanmar refugees in Malaysia and helped re rehabilitate drug users in Myanmar. He was a project coordinator for BBC Media Action Myanmar and is currently a member of the alumni board for the John McCain Global Leaders Program in Washington, D.C. So he will speak to you today uh, uh, what he has as a presentation under the title Beyond the Coup, Myanmar's Political Context and Diaspora Activities. Please welcome Mr. Hong. Good morning, everyone. Once again, I'm Zhao Du Kong, and I'm, glo uh, I'm McCain Global Leader and also a founder of 2D Isolated Art Program. I will just 
begin my talk by saying a very special thanks to Dr. Sonia and Natasha for giving this opportunity to share the heartbreaking situation in Myanmar. And also I would like to thank my dear friend Sean, uh, who is not being with us. Uh, he is now in Florida. And uh, he has been very kind and very uh, supportive of Myanmar uh, since the beginning of the coup. Uh, Sean and I both graduated from Zhejiang University in China. And uh, he always helped me to amplify the suffering of my country in every possible way. So just a brief background of Myanmar. Myanmar, or formerly known as Burma, stands exactly between the world's largest uh, democratic nation called India and also uh, and the communist country China. Myanmar is also part of the uh, 11 ASEAN uh, countries in South Asia region. Myanmar never got a single year of peace uh, since after we gained independence from the British in 1948 because the armed communist groups, they were greatly supported by Chinese Mao. Uh, they were trying to overthrow the newly uh, and first elected civilian government after we gained independence. So the struggle between the military forces and the democratic forces still continues in Myanmar. So in 2021, on February 1st, the military launched a coup in Myanmar, uh, which was a shock to the entire nation. This happened when we were uh, dealing with COVID-19 pandemic under lockdown and uh, struggling with the economic downturn. I vividly remember that early morning because all of the means of communication were cut off and we were suddenly uh, disconnected from the whole world. And I feel like we were uh, living in the pitch darkness. So that's why I wrote an article and I share my personal experience in the ground situation of Myanmar to my organization, uh, McCain's Institute. And I, and I called it one of the darkest days in the political history of Myanmar. The reason why uh, the the military claimed that the reason why they uh, launched a coup because uh, they thought that the 2020 general election was fraudulent and the election was stolen, uh, but which was extremely contradictory to the independent or international observer remarks that it was a free and fair election. And the military uh, general decided uh, de to declare a state of emergency for a year. Now it has been a two years. So as a global McCain leader, and also that was my very first time uh, coming to the United States, and that's where I saw the democracy in action. So I protest against the military uh, in the best way I could, which is uh, peaceful. But despite conducting our peaceful uh, protest manner, civilians, including women, children, and young people, we all are shot down on the street like animals in the broad daylight in every corner of the streets. Uh, that, that, that was me right in front of the uh, city hall. And uh, the military arrests everyone who was protecting peace with this wall. Uh, uh, this is a young guy uh, that I, uh, at, at, at midnight, they, what they call it security forces, but the soldiers and uh, police, they all came down to our apartment and uh, shot this 80 years old guy. You know. And uh, that night, I remember everyone, everyone in, in my apartment. Actually, we don't know each other, but we all are in the same uh, group because we re we all are against this uh, anti coup uh, regime. And uh, he, he, he was shot down, and that was at uh, 2 a.m. early in the morning. So I was in shock and overwhelmed by emotion. I asked myself, why young people have to suffer? Be the reason why they shot young people because we simply shout, we want democracy, that's it. But that's the practice young people are, uh, in Myanmar have to pay. I don't know how to, uh, how, how, how to describe my feeling right now because it's all the memory and all the painful, it's coming back to me. So that time, uh, the, the only thing that I, that, that, that I could do was I make an effort to bring attention to the situation in Myanmar. At that time, the uh, Russia and Ukraine war hasn't happened yet, right? So, uh, I I contacted uh, the McCain Institute. McCain was very uh, kind enough uh, to amplify my voices and let the people know what's happening in Myanmar. 
So I was I, I gave interview with the McKinsey as as well as all of my international friends as well. And this guy he contacted me from uh, Lithuania. I never been to Lithuania. I met my friends from Lithuania when I was a uh, cohort of the McCain Institute. And through my friends, and uh, he conducted to me and he make sure that the situation of Myanmar is aware among his communities as well. During my time in the United States as a uh, McCain, at that time they called it Next Generation Leader. Now they call it Global McCain Leader. I have the privilege of being placed at the Los Angeles uh, Mayor Office of the International Affair. So uh, once it happened, I reached out to the uh, deputy mayor. His, uh, her name is Ambassador Nina Hachike. And I, I told her that, would you please let uh, LA mayor tweet about the situation in Myanmar. I know that there are many uh, uh, Myanmar community living in uh, Los Angeles. And I know that the city of Angel really cared about uh, democracy and human rights. And to my surprise, uh, actually I was uh, working with the chief photographer and some of the uh, uh, news media department as well. And then uh, LA Mayor right away tweeted for the uh, for for us and and he called it and he said that Burma is a country I know and I love and its people deserve safety, dignity, peace, and the right to choose their leaders. So I'm I'm super super uh, grateful to LA Mayor uh, Eric Garcetti. At the same time, Ambassador Nina was everybody was very supportive of me, and uh, she even t told me that would you please write every week so that I know that you are safe. Not only that, they went above and beyond by meeting with the Myanmar community living in Los Angeles and assured them that they have stand with the people of Myanmar. So the number of peaceful protesters in Myanmar uh, grew larger and stronger, so did the repressive actions of the military general. So this really forced me to take precautions to, to protect myself Whenever I gave uh, TV interviews, including wearing marks, uh, helmet, and even altering my voice. So in one particular interview with an international media based in New York, so I had to take all these measures to conceal my identity and, and to ensure my safety. As you, you are aware that I didn't wear any marks here, but as the situation intends, I have to protect myself as well. As you might already be aware that a country where dictatorship prevail, media is always seen as the enemy of the state. So she's a closer, a closer from mine, a close friend of mine whom I used to work at the BBC media, actually in Myanmar, was arrested and imprisoned simply because she was, she was doing her job of reporting the truth. This is the prize journalists in Myanmar, uh, where being a journalist is considered a crime, and this is, um, Unfortunately, uh, she, still, uh, she's uh, behind the bar. Also, Myanmar military general is known to use a class, very classic tactic to create fear and inside terror among the people. So one of their uh, tactics was to arrest two very prominent uh, political figures who stood against them. The first one is uh, Kyo Zeyato, a popular he hop singers and former member of the parliament. And the second is called Jimmy. Uh, he's a political prisoner who was jailed multiple times due to his political uh, act activists. And during the uh, 1980 uprisings, as well, unfortunately, both of them were executed by hanging. And this is a clear indication that uh, the military consider uh, opposition members as, again, enemies of the state. Since the military coup uh, on February 1st, the number of military aid and RTD truck on uh, civilians has increased as well. And uh, I myself belong to an ethnic group called Kachin. And as a minority who belong or who took part in anti coup activity, yes, as I said, it has been a security concern for me. So I decided to flee to uh, like a hilltop rock of Liza, which is very close to China. And that's where uh, our Kachin uh, Independent Corps, Army KIA, they have been protecting our Kachin people and fighting for the freedom, justice, and self-determination for seven decades. 
And amid the crisis, the national unity of government and core NUT is, uh, uh, was created in opposition to the ruthless military regime, and many of the executive leaders also uh, fled to the Liza. And Liza is also a place where a uh, uh, camp for internally displaced uh, has it surrounded, and that's where I got the first sense to see how the uh, IDB children has been surviving in a makeshift uh, camp. And uh, they are also facing quadruplet uh, humanitarian crisis, the, the fallout of COVID, uh, the COVID-19 uh, shortage of adventures such as water, food, and clothing, and also natural disaster. Um, children in these cases, uh, they, have, they have seen it and experienced something they are not supposed to be seen and experiences. So many of them, as helpless as they are, many of them only able to feel the uh, emotions and those emotions are needed to be expressed in a certain way and uh, what I learned was that the, the best uh, way to express children's suffering is through art. That's where the role of art uh, came into play uh, to act as a language of love and emotion and also to voice their suffering. I remember the this year uh, Oscar winner named uh, Michelle and in Asian actress, she once said that the language of love and emotion can cross all boundaries. So uh, that's where I founded this art program. I would like to tell a few stories. This is uh, Zhao Seng, and uh, he told me that he, he has been always in state of fear and starving because, uh, and his entire life is on the run because the military, the Burmese military always come and attack our uh, villages, uh, sorry, his village. Um, he told me that his parents' entire village were burned down by the military ruthlessly, and family were dispersed, and, uh, and still uh, they could not they could not find a shelter over over their head. And this is Sainu Jia, and she, at her young age, uh, she had seen the humanity against her people. She saw mothers, uh, sister, and friends were being sold into slavery, human uh, trafficking, and she. Did, uh, depicted in her uh, painting. This is uh, the Yajabu, and I, rem I vividly remember the analogy that she used. She said, the life of our ITP are like a blind person who are bounded by chains and was aggressively like slave. She said, the Burmese uh, military came to your village, destroyed your village, and raped your woman. Uh, this is Kong Lung, and as, as you see in his uh, art, he said the atrocities that committed by the military is ruthless and barbaric, and he, he said his art represents a pregnant woman who are haunted by uh, bloodshed, coops, and gunfire, cops, gunfire, and uh, they kill all the kitchen people. So these are just a few stories that I told tell you, but we must remember that there are many stories that are unheard. So over 100 IDP students, Kachin uh, asked me to join my art program, which are called Through the Eyes of Agreement Art Program. And this very program exists in order to uh, amplify the suffering, the atrocity of uh, the people of Myanmar. And also, I want to, to cultivate a culture of hope, love, and compassion. So this is the order by because they, this IDP can uh, live up on the mountain. So we have a daily routine of bringing food up to the mountain. This is how uh, they, 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 they ate uh, just a sticky uh, rice and boiled egg. And because they don't have enough food and since they don't have enough plate, we use uh, banana leaf instead. Uh, so we. They eat only lunch and, uh, sorry, uh, breakfast and dinner because once again, they don't have enough food. And uh, we nibble into small portion, which is not very nutritious, but just to have the energy for them to survive. So since the military group cook in favor first, the number of military, uh, military air and art artillery attack on civilian circuit in Myanmar has drastically increased. And shockingly, what I found was that there, there were at least 600 air attacks by the military between 
uh, February 21st to uh, January 2023, making Myanmar the top country in the world targeted by aerial bombardment against its own civilians. So the number is even higher than the airstrop carried out by Russia on Ukraine. So he is uh, uh, Tom Andrews, who is the uh, UN Special Reporter in Myanmar. And I've just last a couple, uh, couple of um, days ago, the military once again attacked, and many uh, school, ch uh, school children uh, were murdered. Uh, after that event, he called out to the leader and said, how many Myanmar children need to die before war leaders take strong and coordinated action to stop this kind of carnage. So after the coup, more than 3,000 people have been killed. So what does it mean, right? It's heartbreaking to think that in a just uh, blink of an eye, children can become fatherless and motherless because their parents were murdered by the ruthless military. And parents also lost their children in a, sec in a second due to the failure attack by the military. I still remember the story of the medical student. This is uh, his mom. Uh, Parents are very worried, right? So they, they, they ask their children not to go outside and join the protest because they are worried about their safety. But her uh, uh, son, who a uh, uh, fresh medical student, he decided to join secretly. Actually right uh, outside of his home, that's where the military came and shot him on the spot. So this kind of story happened in each and every day. So it's really a devastating to see Innocent life being taken away for standing up their rights. So I want you to imagine in a country where young people are shot down simply because they want democracy. After the coup, the military hunter has jailed over 70,000 people. I also want you to imagine in your shoe, yesterday your beloved friends, your, your parents, your committee members, what were murdered by John Hunter, and the next day, your family, your own family, your own, your own beloved friends fall into the victims of air strikes and arbitrary arrest, and your neighbor children become parentless and displaced. So this kind of the price that Myanmar <coughs> people are currently, and has been paying for uh, since the beginning of the coup, because we are simply exercising our rights and simply exercising our freedom of speech and even voicing our thoughts, and they all are regarded in Myanmar as punishable by death, and we all are criminals. So over 1.5 million people has been dis displaced after the coup. For us, the struggles and uncertainty have become our daily bread and butter. It's very unfortunate that hope seems to be a thing of the past, and there is no hope at all. So about 15 million people face severe shortage of food. Because people are forced to sell all of their belongings just to survive, and now we don't have, uh, we don't left nothing, have nothing left, so this really leads to a situation where there is no food available, and children are starving each and every day. Over 40,000 homes have been torched. So the military, the brutal military burned down all the villages, raped their women, and this is very classic tactic that they have been using in order to dehumanize, dehumanize uh, people, to incite fear, and to create a culture of, uh, a climate of fear. It's very unfortunate Ignatian children have no access to education as well. So in Myanmar now, the military has produced lost generation. Apart from the bloodshed and killing, what Myanmar left is a generation, a generation of loss, a generation of traumatized people.
And also, Myanmar is well known for its political history, and everybody may have heard about the infamous cases of Rohingya ethnic cleansing, which is highly condemned by the whole world. Also, Myanmar is now caught off uh, in the middle of the second longest world war between the uh, civil war between the ethnic armed groups and the anti military. And also, Myanmar has become a failed nation. And Myanmar was under six decades long uh, full military control and slowly opened up to the quasi democratic in 2011, but now tragically fall back into the ruler's military again. The reason why I tell all the story, everything, is that I really want you to let you know and inform you that Myanmar's brutal military regime is a mass murderer. They are war criminal and also a cheerleader for genocide. Why I was in Myanmar, I always felt disconnected. I always felt uh, isolated. I always felt we are forgotten. I always felt that nobody listened to us. Nobody, no matter how crying out loud we did, we went, I remember I went to. U.S. is in front of the U.S. Embassy and all the embassy, all the all the UN uh, uh, office building. We feel like nobody really cared about us. It seems that at least at least uh, U.N. General Secretary has stated that we, the international community, have failed, and we, the people of Myanmar, still has been fighting. Whenever I think of the children uh, who cry in front of me and. Uh, and also, I, thought I didn't mention here that when the Russian-Ukraine war happened, uh, the our student they felt so much angry and driven with emotion. I shared it with uh, before I came here. We were uh, uh, in Finnish at the Arizona State University. They are now commemorating Genocide Awareness Week, and I shared this story. Our starving children felt so much anger, and they, they, they just thought that people, uh, people are going through the similar situation, situation uh, but in another country. They never, seen, uh, they never been to any other city where they just up in the mountain. But when they fell, when they heard the Russian-Ukraine war happen, because now the military general and uh, Putin has a great relationship now. So, uh, we paint ourselves. We paint ourselves with the uh, uh, Ukraine national flag and also our Kachin flag. We stand together. I, I send out to all the uh, Ukrainian foreign friends and Ukrainian everybody. So that's where the uh, U.S. ambassador had seen it, and he, he thought that this is a good message that you should tell. What I'm trying to tell is that although we felt like nobody heard of. But we're thinking about other people who are who are going through the similar situation. So during my interview in Myanmar, I was asked uh, by a reporter from New York, "What message would you like to give on Myanmar's political crisis?" To which I reply, "Use your freedom to promote us because we need you." So in my eyes, and that was my coming to the United States as a McCain global leader. That was my very first time coming to the United States. In my eyes, I always seen America as a champion of democracy and human rights. Because I genuinely believe that when America upholds values and did the right thing, not only does the nation uh, benefit, but also the gl global community trust as well. Particularly all the young people who, uh, of the, who live in America, I very jealous of them, and I really believe that they are very fortunate to live in a land, a land of freedom, a land of liberty, and a land of many rights. Therefore, I would like to conclude my presentation. I urge each and every one of the students, and also everyone who, who lives in the in this world of America, I really urge you to use your freedom to help and promote and support ours. And I, I would like to say once again, thank you all so much for listening to my presentation. Appreciate it.
Yes. Uh, I think the American government still calls us Burma. So in your website, you will find it uh, Burma. Uh, in, in Myanmar embassy as well. Oh, US embassy in Myanmar, they still use Burma. Uh, after the 1980 uprising, a very infamous uprising, suddenly the military general decided to use this Myanmar. So uh, it has nothing to do with the will of the people of Myanmar. People of Myanmar. So the currently Myanmar is our country registered at the United Nations as Myanmar. So uh, the West uh, like to call us Burma, and one of the uh, very famous historian, who is the uh, grandson of the uh, former UN General Secretary Ho Udan, he he's a famous historian. He said he still like to call it Burma because it's connected to the history. So when the British colonized us, they called us Burma. So, um, <laughs> so that's why I call it Myanmar, or formerly known as Burma. So that some people might get it all, which country that I'm talking about. So, yes. First of all, I think India is a democratic nation, and uh, a lot of, uh, after the coup, right, a lot of Myanmar, as I said, 1.5 million displaced, so many people have uh, moved to uh, Thailand, Bangladesh, not China, because I, 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 was, I was, you know, hiding at the jungle, which is called China, this is, this is China, this is Myanmar, but what happened is that the Chinese government had already built a huge giant uh, iron wall, so it's impossible for us to cross the China. So, but uh, India, because there's uh, some of the ethnic group live in uh, close to the Mizoram state as well. So there are thousands of people. And I, I, I just, recently I just came back from uh, Indianapolis. Indianapolis were a large community of Chin peoples as well. They really support, uh, I mean, millions of money to the uh, tribes as well. Uh, I don't know how the, uh, let me put it this way. Uh, what China won is, uh, they only care about the business, right? So after the COVID, zero, zero COVID policy, uh, once the military uh, launched a coup after that, we are not allowed to use uh, uh, Facebook and Instagram. So it's illegal. Uh, that time, the yeah, government don't know how to figure it out. So the Chinese government, they really helped to technological ways as well for us to ban the Facebook and Instagram and everything. And also, China does not have a relationship with the opposition uh, government called NUG, National Union Government. But they have a huge connection with the military. So I would say, India, I, India does not publicly support the military general, but still have a good connection with the Myanmar. So I would probably say they still, they, well, at the UN Security Council, right? China likely to stay uh, to be neutral, but Russia seems likely to, you know, publicly support the military general. They they allowed to they sell all the artillery, bomb, and everything. What China want is uh, not the stable Myanmar. That's for sure. Because since, as I said, Myanmar never got a single year of peace after we gained independence. So China have a great benefit of you know, having that chaos as well. But at the same time, they want uh, stable. So they really figured out whom to support as well. So that, that, that's something that I uh, see in the position of China. Yeah, so on the faithful first, uh, 
the Parliament was about to presume. So on the very on the February first, this is the day that you know the the uh, winning party will take you know swim as the new president. Like that's that is the day before we uh, take the vote. They, 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 that time everybody was in uh, the capital city at the uh, capital, and they arrest everybody like that. So they are still in the prison, and some of them escape, and some of them escape to India, and some of them came back to some of the elected, that time, 2020, 20, the elected uh, member of parliament, they flee to uh, Liza, where I was hiding as well now, so many of the executive leaders, and then they created what, the, what, what we call national unity of government, a shadow government, a position government, the, uh, they are hiding in different places across Myanmar and also across neighboring. And now they are, they have just last couple of months ago they uh, launched a new office in uh, Washington D.C. trying to get the legitimacy from the international uh, uh, community. So what usually happens during uh, revolutions and coups and these kind of uh, conflicts is the government loves to shut down the internet, right? Yes. <laughs> We've seen it over and over in different countries like Iran. Um, you, you mentioned that they, they shut down the different social media. Thing. So how about how about right now? Do does Myanmar still have um, access to um, internet? Yeah, it's 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 very in, it's very interesting, right? When when on, on the very first day, they cut off all the internet, or uh, internet, all the means of communicating. The only that I seen were on the uh, the military propaganda media called, you know, and, uh, Myanmar, uh, you know, TV, and Miaudi, and that's where we see. That's the only thing that we seen on screen that, oh, we are not, you know, uh, taking power from you. We're just holding it, and everything's gonna be fine like that. It's very interesting, right? For after that, uh, the military, this is the worst, longest military detector ever lived on the planet. So uh, what happened is that they also, they, this military have a, a conglomerate of business, right? They do a lot of business as well. So it's really failed their business too. So it is impossible for them at one, at one hand, they want to shut down everything and then they let the international people, community know that everything is fine. But at the same time, they are losing their business as well. So it is impossible for them to shut completely down. But what, what they did is that they shut the Facebook, right? So I had two phones uh, when I was in Myanmar, right? One, you have to, we have to be very active. And when I, when I was studying with Sean at, in China, we have to use the VPN, right? But in Myanmar, I feel like I'm, <laughs> I'm, I'm now fall back, you know, I'm, I feel like I'm in China now like that because the, the China help uh, with technology too, how to, you know, build a war you know, not to access to the uh, Facebook and uh, Instagram like that. So, for them, they definitely would like to shut everything down, but that will be a control, that will be a self-defeating as well, so it's impossible. I, I was asked the same question by the Arizona State University students as well, how would you judge? For the media as well, they see me as this, you know, enemy of the state, but it is impossible for them to completely shut down because they like to share their propagandas as well. So I, I call it uh, a good person use media for a greater cause, a good uh, for a noble cause, but an evil person use media for you know, evil, evil uh, purpose. That's the question I ask myself every day. I ask all the people who are expert. Uh, we have been in Myanmar on the ground for so many years, and it seems like we, we don't have a simple answers for that because it is not, it is not a simple, uh, let's say apartheid, like you see that this is a black and this is a white, right? So in Myanmar, it's very complicated situation, right? We got this one like that. So, you know, we have a seven decade long civil conflict, you know, where the world's second, uh, world's second longest civil war after Israel and Palestinian conflict. Now we got 
Rohingya issue, right, which is condemned, which is called the ethnic cleansing. You know, it's a genocide like that. So it's very complicated, but what at the end of the day, what we usually say is that as long as we didn't give up, we didn't, we didn't give up, and uh, we will win. That's the only thing that we can say. And we, we have to, yes, yeah, sometimes it's very frustrating. It's been two years, it's been decades. Everybody's so tired of it. Nobody wanted people just want their life, right? So once it happened, uh, in Myanmar, that the what we call the civil disobedience movement, right? Doc, professional doctor, teachers, engineer, everybody, everybody decided not to work in order to paralyze the the, the government system. But still, uh, people are struggling, right? Some people go back and join uh, the the system like that. So I don't know. I don't. Know, I do not have a simple answers, and I I very much hope that the, that. Would, this kind of situation never happened in Myanmar. For me, right, my grand, grand, grandparents, my father's generation, our generation have suffered the military, the repressive, and you know, every, every, we have suffered all sort of you know, strategy under the military. I really do not want next generation to be going the same like us. So I really, I, for me, I have determined to speak up for the people of Myanmar and to do whatever possible way I can. And as I mentioned earlier, the, the uh, arts program, they are grown up in the IDB camp. They know how to speak the official language as well. So I was talking with the ASU as well. They kept the, what they call it, educational humanity, where they, none of the certificates you know, accept that by, or they don't have any cr credibility. So I'm trying to reach out my possible way to help them. And I'm pretty sure that there are many individual, you know, from Myanmar like me who are trying to promote peace, stability as well. As long as people like me, individual, are doing their best, I sincerely hope that we, we will get what we want. And I, since we are in the international, I would like the international community that please support the people of Myanmar. And also, we don't want another war, right? At first, at first, our young people, let's say, well, please, r to b and no flying zone, please send us the weapon. We're gonna fight this one like that. But what the best way we can do, please, let's say that, please stop the free flow of weapon, right? Russia selling tons of, you know, um, artillery and weapons to military general. Let's stop it, right? So let's do what we can. And I think that will turn the best out. And I'm hope, and I'm very much hoping that <laughs> <laughs> at the end of the day, at the end of the day, the ordinary people are the one you know who has to suffer. <coughs> who have been affected by that. I have seen it. I have experiences. I have gone through it. I really want to stop. And yeah, let's let's uh, you know uh, join together and stop this brutal military. So, and it will make our war a little bit you know uh, peace of mind. Is nowadays any possibility of? Uh opposition to exist in the country politically or is there like an exiled minority of political representatives that maybe live somewhere else and prepare to come and bring some changes or is there something like that? Yes, uh, we do have the uh, opposition. So in, in the uh, ethnic area, this is the Chin state where I was born and raised, right? So we are close to China. And we got uh, Chin State, right? So the, our ethnic group had their own armies as well because we have to defend its people like that. At the same time, the what we call the opposite government called National Unitary Government, we, it was created after the coup. So uh, still a, a lot of executive leaders still live in the, at the Chin area. I wasn't supposed to say that, but anyway, uh, uh, their area and uh, some, let's say the uh, what uh, foreign minister of the NUG, she is now currently resides in residing in uh, Washington D.C. But at the same time, travel across the world as well, trying to get the international legitimacy that we are the you know legitimate government, not the military council. So we still didn't call them military government. We call it military council or military regime because we don't, you know, uh, acknowledge that we are government like that. So the uprising or the resistance movement is still strong. It's all across the, uh, uh, across, across the Myanmar. Any other
Yeah, uh, Myanmar is a very sad scenario and situation, right? So we never got union of Myanmar uh, before we get independent. Even when British came and ruled us, they ruled us with uh, the divide and conquer group, right? So this is the group, this is the group. We even call it, they don't call us ethnic group, they call us a uh, tribe, you know, a hill tribe like that. So what uh, they rule us separately as well. And we never experienced the, sort of the federal democracy, right? So the, the Burmese majority rule and they to take everybody's as well. Uh, we have, this is what we hope, right? So we are very much hoping that the ethnic armed group, you know, come together and fight against the military and, you know, overthrow this one once and for all and then let this guy what we want, what the ethnic people want, right? At the end of the day, Democracy is not about what the majority want. Democracy is about protecting the minority rights as well. So that's what we are aiming for. And uh, after the coup, a lot of people seen uh, the the military as one common enemy. In the past, they used to say that oh, they, because they, they don't see the Myanmar as uh, you know collective or we, we got a two identity, one ethnic identity and also religious identity as well. So with the Rohingya case, that was the religious identity. Oh, this is the Muslim, and we have to get out like that. So now we see that, oh, the reason why we got this identity, we are not, you know, uh, united as a country is because the military, you know, divide and they rule us. So uh, now people see the military is the only uh, common enemy for everyone. And I'm very much hoping that people come together and uh, fight against this uh, military once and for all, and uh, and uh, compromise right what uh, what we want and negotiate each other for the benefit of the ordinary people. Yes, uh, whenever I talk about those who are, I become very emotional because I might say I flee, right? But at least somehow I can connect with the McCain Institute. Oh, would you please help me? I don't have any food to eat. Would you please help me? At least they help me to reach. At least they know that, at least I, I know that they are with me. But for the, those kids, but what happened is that after the coup, right, you can only withdraw cash, uh, 200,000 jets, which is only US $50 in a, in a week. So uh, we have a short deal of cash as well. And uh, my former organization, BBC Media Action, they have to stop. At first, they're going to postpone the program because they cannot withdraw the cash. So they really have to stop all the program and all of my, uh, all of my friends, they have to resign. So uh, to answer your question, uh, if you are a humanitarian aid worker and you are regarded as criminal, so many of my friends, let's say medical doctor, and we just collect each other money and then provide them. And if they find out, you will be arrested, you will be in prison. So that's the situation we are in. So what I did was I went to the Liza and I see these kids and I don't know what to do. I, I feel a sense of guilt. I always I cry and I and said, what can I do, right? And then I reach out to my uh, former organization in uh, uh, New Zealand called Union Aid. At least they gave me some money so that they could survive like that. But they cannot send me right money. So what I did is that they send to money to the US or they send money to the Thailand first. If in your bank account, if they see that suddenly a lot of money came in and you will be asked as well, your bank account will be frozen as well. So it's very difficult. But at the same time, when you are in a desperate situation, people will find every possible means or every possible way to survive and to help these kids. And the international community are not allowed to enter and help us well because we are not, I call it, ordinary or usual situation. So everyone has, I don't know, but that in my situation, that's the way I help uh, my uh, student. And now the UN tried to get some, uh, uh, contract with the uh, military regime, but at the same time, the, the the people of Myanmar was worried that it really, if they have you know some agreement with the uh, if the United Nations have make some agreement with the military council, it also means that they give them some legitimacy as well. So they don't want to happen like that. So we are in a very 
difficult and challenging situation for both parties who would like to help as well. If you help somebody like that, if somebody knows that you are helped by someone, let's say you just only give, let's say 50 US dollars, then sometimes it give them some risks. Now I was just talking with the Asian director of the ASU, right? So he said, let's say we, we would like to help your student, your uh, IDB student, right? Your kid, but do you think that that will put them you know, at risk? We don't want to make it happen because they are very cautious about it. So like that, so yeah, I'm still figuring out how to reach out to them as well. I hope, I really hope the military regime allow some international community, right? It, 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 it is impossible for us to have each other because you have to survive your own as well. I really hope the international, they allow the international organization, right? Uh, as, even a small organization, let them allow, you know, help this, you know, starving children. But what they can do right now is that you have to flee other countries, let's say Bangladesh or Thailand or India or even Malaysia. And that's why I just made, uh, uh, he is not running a huge international organization, but it's a small, small group, but he was uh, supported by the USA. So he went there at the border of the Thai, and that that's where he, he helped a small community. So that's the thing. That, that you have to, if you want to get help, then you have to flee as well. But how you gonna flee? If we got a neighbor, neighbor aggressive neighbor to China, it is impossible. Yes, it's 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 very interesting, right? Yeah, we got a. Myanmar and Russia had a good relationship since the beginning of you know independent, right? Usually they send the uh, junior and uh, senior officer to, to the uh, Russian military academy as well. It seems like now economically we depend, we much more depend on China. So military we depend on uh, uh, Russia, and even uh, imagine it when Russia you know uh, attack on Ukraine and Myanmar you know killing its own people. In that scenario, uh, Russian Putin right, decided to meet the genocide leader, the military chief, uh, me online in uh, Moscow. So in just last week, Myanmar, this is the biggest uh, festival for the Myanmar Buddhist people. The majority of our Buddhists is celebrating what we call it a water festival, right? So what we did is that they invite even individual uh, uh, Russian, and then they allowed them to uh, 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 entertain the people. And they said Russia and Myanmar has a good relationship, and that was for uh, you know uh, uh, broadcast at the uh, uh, state media. So they, they like to show that Russia and Myanmar has a good relationship, and you know even uh, leader to leader or state to state at the same time to people to people communication as well that's the way they uh, spread the propaganda among the people of Myanmar also to the international media as well unfortunately the dictators are very united why our the democratic forces are trying to tear each other down yeah that's just that's very sad Yeah, that's a very good question. And uh, once again, we have to remember that this is the world longest military dictatorship that ever lived on the planet. You study political science, you will know that the military dictatorship, you will see the burn. I never studied political science back home in Myanmar. I studied political science along with Sean in China, and our professor is from Colorado, a white man living, uh, teaching us political, political science in China. And that was the very first time I see that, oh my God, my country is the love. Because when, when I was very young, we don't have faith when everything, that like we only get the propaganda. But now I think, uh, but now what I've seen is that first, they, they uh, create a, a climate of fear. So by arresting all the people, let's say at one time, 
uh, let's say you don't you don't participate in that water fast simple which is run at the tree and then you change your Facebook profile and then you will be arrested let's say if you are a social influencer you don't say that I are against the military you just change the profile into black during the water fast day. why every why the military run you know um, fast people this happening and you will be arrested so this is the way the inside fear but at the same time on the media right celebrate they will show all those you know, at first they don't have the audience as well, but they show the state and they're all oh, I am just you know having a good time like that. They show that oh Myanmar is now very stable like that. I would say uh, the military general is trying all the possible way to 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 create fear by arresting, by imprisoning people, all the political fears and everything. But at the same time having a strong good relationship with the uh, other uh, other dictatorship like Xi Jinping and uh, Putin, and uh, at the same time they try they still uh, block you know uh, Facebook and Instagram, so they use all the tactic. Oh, I have to mention that once it's happened, right? So all the uh, ground troop infantry they went and attack all the uh, ethnic area. But what happened is that since they don't have a moral, you know, they fail. So now they now what happened is that they don't have they, they don't know how to recruit new soldiers. So what they did is that all the milit all the ethnic group we none of the ethnic group we don't have uh, air air jack or artillery. So what they did is that they use the conduct you know uh, uh, the air strike and they attack all the ethnic area. This, so for the military in order to survive, that's the only th only method that they, that. Uh, they use in order to attack all the arms ethnic group because we don't have that, uh, uh, you know, uh, jack, uh, uh, jack, uh, jack fighter to attack, you know, to against the uh, military. Now, yes, the, the military general having the, the very difficult to recruit new soldiers because nobody wanted and nobody really wanted to fight. And only I want to mention that there, there was no sign of immune, immunity since the founding of the army. Because if you, if the soldier, yeah, if the senior soldier find out that, you know, you are, uh, and I, and I have, and I heard that they are not allowed to go outside, and they are not allowed to watch uh, any other news media except the state propaganda, and they have to stay only inside the troop or the inside of the military compound. So they they use all the possible means to, you know, uh, to to repress their own soldiers. But at the same time, to spread the propaganda and to repress its own civilians as well. I got your point absolutely, and uh, I felt that one before I. Uh, before, until you leave your country, you don't know how oppressed you are. That's exactly right. And the very first time I went to Thailand, I see the because Thailand and Myanmar very close, right? That was I said, oh my god! I didn't know that I was oppressed for so many years. I didn't get the internet. I didn't get everything. So when when you are under the uh, regime and you don't know what is your rights as well and then you you are used to that system so uh but what happened is in 2011 right suddenly the military general and somehow gives some power to the uh, people of myanmar there was a, a rising uh, opposition energy as well so in 2011 where everybody the international government think that all myanmar has changed even the president the ex-president, he is an ex-general, even he was nominated for the uh, Nobel Peace Prize as well. Oh my God, this is a genuine development. But there was uh, power co uh, confusion as well. And so 2011, suddenly our economy had grown up. Even uh, US uh, former President Barack Obama came to our nation not only once, but twice. 
along with my uh, uh, deputy mayor and my host organization, Ambassador Nina Hatika. So uh, this is the way they can you know, manipulate you know, their true intentions as well. But at that time, uh, a lot of young people, they, they, they know what's, what, what it looked like you know, uh, to be living some sort of free dance as well. You can somehow criticize you know, your government as well. Some political prisoners were released, dancers, some media, uh, f uh, press, freedom of press as well. So some of the very prominent uh, journalists even came to Myanmar, and a lot of, a lot of uh, businessmen living in uh, Singapore, Thailand, and, and, and even United States, they came because they want to you know, be part of the genuine, well, part of you know, development. So that's why when the military launched a coup, some I have seen even there is a, some local news media reported as well. Her father is a general, and then they decided to come out. He said, "I can't use Facebook, I can't use uh, Instagram. Why my father, you know, oppress us like that?" That time the military hasn't shot everybody. Everybody asked, "Yeah." So we you can protect. Literally, I you you will see in, in, in my uh, photo that I was one of the first group that against the military general. So you will see that we are right in front of the, the, the soldiers and the uh, police. So up, up, up on the uh, city hall, they, they have a snipers as well. So we are very scared, but that time they, they, they are not, I don't know they are not allowed, but they haven't shoot at all yet, to be honest. That time I was a very first group, my friend, oh, you speak English, would you please, none of the media reported yet, would you please say the English, the last spread, you know, awareness about me anymore. All that, I'm so scared because I'm holding, I'm holding the, you know, the chief uh, of the staff. Actually, I'm shaking like that, right? But I, I know that it's gonna be worth it like that. So uh, that's that, that's a very good question. I would say the young people has taste. What it like, you know, to be, you know, living. What it like to to be free. So people will not give up now. So they they know exactly what. Uh, uh, to be lived under the repressive government. So that's why I think young people, even the older generation, when we were on the street, many of the young, uh, older generation, don't do that, don't do that, don't do that, don't do that. And then we call it, we call ourselves Generation Z, right? And we got just new, uh, next generation, we gonna uh, determine what kind of future, what we want. Not you guys, we call it Generation F. And you know what's that? I mean, you guys are Generation F. If you don't want to protest along with us, if you are not in a group with us, you better shut up and we're gonna lead our nation. So young people are very, in, in the age of the media, where you are connected, right? I'm connected with Sean. We have hasn't been love talk for so many years, but he connected me. So it's really gave me hope and a lot of people like that. Yes, we taste a little bit about freedom and now we want it more. We hunger for freedom, we hunger for new development, we hunger for a better future. You have a very <clears throat> good command of the English language and uh, as you mentioned, um, they wanted you to speak because you could speak English. Um, how many people there speak different languages, not necessarily English, but you know, another language that, so that the communication is easier you know, outside internationally? And how do you learn that? Because I know you said that the schooling, you're having struggles with schooling, so. Well, uh, when we, as a person who, you know, who had gone through, suffering through the military regime, I, did, I started learning English when I was a university student. I learned it by myself, so we don't have a good uh, quality education. But in 2011, I see there are many uh, uh, private school, uh, private school as well. I, I'm, I'm very glad to see that some next generation, you know, they catch us English easily. For us, we don't have it. Let's say I want to learn English. Where, where I'm going to learn none of this English as well. So third, English is my third language. My own ethnic language is called Kachin. I don't speak very well, unfortunately. I should be very ashamed of myself. But I speak the, the official language called the uh, Burmese, which is the uh, official language where the majority speak. And one thing is that we are oppressed, right? So we are not allowed to learn our own ethnic language because we are oppressed by the military and they, you have to speak only. Let's say if we will not join the civil public, if I'm Kachin or if I speak not Burmese, then you are not promoted like that. So uh, I'm a Christian, so I read Bible, I try to read Bible in English, so I, I, I try to sing the, 
the Christian hymn and song, so that's the way I improve my English. And uh, when you are in a desperate uh, situation, uh, even there's nobody, and you will try. I, I still remember my very first time speaking English. I see one white guy, and then I'm very sad and scared. My aunt said, would you please go? He pushed me, literally pushed me. And I, 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 at first, my, my aunt said, he, he only, he only knows English word, hello. He said, hi, hello, and then, no, your turn, go. That's the way I speak. She forced me like that. So a lot of people practice their English to uh, foreigners, right, to tourists, and uh, uh, hello like that. So, yes. I don't know, I, I hope I answered your question. So. I get one real quick. So following up on Generation F, uh, for a military to hold people in power like that, I mean, there's not enough soldiers for that to happen unless a lot of the people are willing or even support what's going on. What holds them together? What holds the majority together? Is it a combination of ethnicity, religion, whatever, economic power? That's a very, very good question. I, and, I, and I even wrote an article about it uh, for the academic paper because ma many of them, they don't write about it. So once again, this military has been staying in power for seven decades. So they have, basically they are in, they are everywhere. I still remember when I was very young, right? If you talk about, if you talk, if you like, if you talk about, if you just only joke about uh, the military, you will be arrested. I, that's why none of the, I, I never seen political science book, I never seen political attire like that because everybody will be in prison. So the military has been be a very uh, systematic uh, institution, which is very strong. And uh, what holds them together is fear, I would say, fear. And if uh, some of the general, uh, they like to you know, cooperate with the democratic forces. If they know that if they show that his position will resign, his entire family will be wiped out. And what happened is that a lot of military, they even run uh, uh, huge business as well. That's communication, uh, uh, in terms of telecommunication, hotel, everything. Let's say if I have never, never, ever seen anybody become rich without association with the military. Never seen. I, I'm not rich. If, if Burmese people are studying in America, oh my God, there's something to do with the military as well. So, in terms of let's in terms of religion, they all are Buddhist. If you want to, if you want to serve in the military, you have to be a Buddhist. I was, I was thinking when I, I finished my matriculation examination, I was thinking to join the uh, uh, military as a uh, med medical student. But I wasn't uh, uh, allowed, right? Because I belong to minority. I just say I don't, I, I don't belong to Buddhism as well. So religion is something that they they use. They they, poli they politicize the religion as well. So religion is the main thing. Now what happened is that in any event, one of the spokesperson of the military. What happened is after he killed thousands of people, he decided to be a monk. Now, now he just shaved his head and he said, "Oh, I, you know, I, I become a good guy now." So that's, that's the way they um, uh, perpetrate their, their perpetuate their power, and it, fear, religion, and race as well. If you if you are Burmese, you are the majority, and you are the superior, and you will get all the uh, benefit like that. And uh, business. So if you want to if you want to be successful in Myanmar, you have to associate with the a Burmese military, that's if I apply for uh, company registration. Yes, they, they will give you more, probably after one year, or two years, five years. But now if you worship them, if you close with them, you will get right away like that. So in terms of business, in terms of society, in terms of religion, in terms of ethnicity, everywhere is, you know, they take in all aspects of our area. So it's very strong. Uh, sometimes thinking about, you know, uh, destroying this uh, regime. It's so challenging because they, they have been there for so many years. I mean, years being decades, seven decades. So it's very difficult, but I believe in miracle, right? So hopefully people come together and uh, with unyielding, uh, unwavering determination and unshakable 
unbreakable strengths, and uh, that will be something uh, I would like to see. Yeah. But it, it's very interesting that we never have a history of immunity, right? In theory, you might heard of the uh, power revolution, the people power revolution in the Philippines, where the Marcos, right, he was, he was overthrown. What happened? Thousands of people came up, millions of people joined. But Marcos never flees his country until, until his close general decided to cooperate with the people of Philippines. If that's happened in Myanmar, I know that's going to be really a huge win for everybody. But none of them step, for, step forward because of the religion, because of the, the business that you belong to, because, because of everything, because you are, everything is controlled by the military. I hope you answer your questions. Oh, very good, thank you. <laughs> um, one last question. Uh, now you have been in the West, and I saw that you collaborated with BBC, and you're in the organization in Washington, D.C. So uh, do you see enough coverage of what's happening in Myanmar, in the United States, through venues like CNN or PBS? or MSNBC or something like that? Well, my short answer, unfortunately, no. Uh, before uh, Russia invasion of Ukraine, yes, there was uh, uh, some coverage as well. And, but after the Ukraine, uh, after the Russian Ukraine war and also Afghanistan, and uh, there was less and less coverage. And my, my, I always suggest the community as well, please cooperate with the uh, Ukraine government and also uh, show your support to the people of Afghanistan as well, because we are in this together, because they understand when you are you know, oppressed, when you are under that situation. And uh, yes, unfortunately, uh, there was less and less coverage, and yes, I, I completely understand. Uh, that's, why I'm, <laughs> that's why if I'm given a chance to talk, I always make sure that you know, I, I give some time to talk about Myanmar to raise awareness. I will be very blessed to, to, to give my interview with the CNN and CNBC. If you know anybody from the CNN, anybody, please let me know. I'm more than willing to cooperate with all the uh, media.